Well, developing knowledge towards solution and uh, dealing with the uh, variety of actors who have uh, very, um, well, different behaviors is also at the heart of our next panelist. I'm glad to introduce Henry Lucen Goa to you, who works at DEFRA, which is like the UK Department for uh, Energy, uh, no, sorry, for <laughs> Environment, <laughs> Food and Rural Affairs. And uh, actually, I met Henry like, like 10 years ago when we worked together for the European Environment Agency and a project then. We met again indeed and I discovered that actually what you do right now to develop a new water regulation is at the heart of what we seek to discuss here. So I was therefore delighted that Henry accepted our invitation to be here on the panel and I would like to give you the floor, Henry. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. It's been a fascinating couple of days. Um, and. Uh, it's amazing to uh, see an OECD presentation. You know, I expect I worked in the OECD or worked on trade and environment agenda. I was part of the joint session of trade and environment experts in the 90s, uh, representing Australia, actually. So, um, yeah, I didn't remember hearing anything on those lines uh, in that context. Um, so um, I thought I might say, do a similar sort of thing in terms of slightly giving a bit of background as where I'm coming from um, academically, if you like and then talk a, a little bit about um, the reform process uh, we've been doing to the water abstraction management regime, which is absolutely, uh, it's a transition, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's exactly what uh, Xavier has been um, talking about. Um, so, I, I am an economist, um, uh, I, I'm a practicing economist for the last 20 odd years, um, but um, my first degree was actually in philosophy. Um, and so when you come to study economics, having uh, previously studied uh, philosophy, it gives you a certain sort of perspective on it, uh, which I think a lot of other people don't have. Uh, so a lot of the time over the last 20 odd years has been uh, a, 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 my own sort of private journey to, uh, to find a, an economics that I felt uh, I, could, uh, I could apply and, and, and find practical and useful. Um, and so I've been involved in exploring application of behavioral economics, international political economy, agent-based mo modeling, institutional economics, complexity economics, and so forth. And I suppose that the label I would put on myself now is a, a sort of pluralist economist, uh, uh, which for me means that um, you start fundamentally with the problem and recognizing you're dealing with complex systems uh, that have economic aspects in them involve economic transactions and things that people label as economics or the economy in some sense, but of course they interact with loads of other systems. Um, and then of course what is important in that system is totally contingent on the particular issue or the particular problem or, uh, uh, that you need to address and try and uh, discover answers for or solve or whatever. Uh, and therefore there are a whole range of disciplines that uh, may have uh, a role or contribution uh, to uh, addressing and, and trying to work through what is uh, what is a way forward, uh, as well as clearly the people actually involved living in the system. <laughs> um, so pluralist economics is firstly multidisciplinary. Uh, it's saying the economy is actually uh, there are lots of disciplines that have a, uh, an ability to provide some understanding as to how the economic system and its related systems work. Uh, and secondly, it says that within economics itself. There are a whole range of strains of economics um, that can also contribute uh, to, uh, to differing extents. Uh, so it's contrasted with, I suppose, a monist approach where you sort of go with methodology, will solve any problem that comes your way sort of approach, to an approach where you're trying to develop fit-for-purpose methods uh, and disciplinary approaches to, to tackle the, the, the particular issue and system that you're, you're trying to explore. Um, and I think that is the the way we have to move, uh, and, uh, and I think with, uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on with, for instance, the chief economist of the World Bank um, describing the last 30 years of macroeconomics as a, as a cult uh, led by... Uh, that's true, he actually used the word cult uh, uh, in, a, in a paper. It's, worth, uh, it's called The Trouble with Macroeconomics, so it's worth, <laughs> worth reading just because it's a sociological analysis of how economics is practiced uh, by the top 
economists uh, published in the top journals uh, in the world. So um, I think we're at a sort of crux moment. Um, but coming down to the sort of practice, uh, for the last um, five or six years, I've had the, the privilege, incredible privilege, of actually working on a policy area which I've, um, I've sort of, well, you never quite have a blank sheet of paper, but I sort of had a blank sheet of paper to start with, you know, what were we going to do about this sort of thing? And uh, I've seen it through, uh, which is sort of rare for civil servants who tend to sort of dot around the place and uh, you know, get bored with one thing and move on to another, um, or at least have uh, career aspirations, I guess, um, to, to follow through a, a, a policy area. Um, and we're almost at the point of uh, legislation. Of course, we're not nearly implementation we're committed to in the 2020s. I'm not sure if I'm going to quite stick around with that, but uh, um, <laughs> there, there are limitations to how long you can stay in a particular area. But, um, so we had a blank sheet of paper, and, uh, and I suppose... Um, there was a little bit of, you know, we started off with some traditional sort of ideas of price versus cap and trade systems, all that sort of thing. But uh, uh, what the, the journey, I suppose, uh, everyone's on a journey, aren't they? Um, the journey I was on, <laughs> had his highs and lows. Um, <laughs> the journey I was on really was about trying to get traction uh, with um, the, the sort of people on the ground with some ideas and some possibilities so that they moved from seeing me as, uh, certainly not as a practitioner, some sort of London-based uh, sort of alien coming into their world and uh, instructing them about a, a new regulatory framework that they were going to have, to actually having a, a sort of story where we'd start off, started really off with what problems they were facing uh, and how um, this, what can be quite a complex new regulatory system, might actually help solve the problems uh, that they face. Um, and that's quite, a, that's quite a big jump because um, regulation is often not seen as something to help solve anything. <laughs> it's usually seen as something that's going to create problems. So you start the conversation at a somewhat of a disadvantage. Um, so to, to get to a place where someone can actually see a regulatory framework as, as an opportunity, as a possibility that actually will help them uh, um, you know, help them with their business, help them sort of survive, help them manage their risks around water uh, is, a, is a huge uh, uh, space to get to. Uh, and we've done that a lot about really getting out, meeting people and trying to find people who, who had a problem they could see now. Because a lot of our talk initially was about climate change, water scarcity, etc., etc. Uh, but a lot of that <coughs> feels a very long way away. Is climate change happening? How do we know? I mean, you know, it's not something you sort of see on the ground. Ah, that's climate change. Um, it's sort of post hoc uh, theorised that that could possibly, on some chance of percentage, etc., uh, be climate change. Um, there's also, of course, that um, people have some experiences which you can work with, droughts and so forth, which is not about climate change, possibly. Um, but then... <clears throat> There's, there may not be solutions. Everyone, all the farmers say, well, of course, we need more reservoirs, and they immediately get to talking to you about planning regime and how the planning regime won't let them build reservoirs. Um, but we eventually sort of linked up with a story around water companies investing in new assets because resilience was, is getting into a sort of uh, a, a place where there's more belief that's needed, to then the fact that with a, uh, a sort of institutional arrangement with regulations that work will actually allow farmers to access some of the water in these new major uh, investments. Uh, and then you can sort of discuss that the regulatory regime is just a way of helping facilitate um, the movement of that water uh, from uh, those assets, reuse schemes, reservoirs or whatever, through natural systems uh, to a farmer. Uh, and then something that seems a bit real. Um, and then they can think, well, I could either build myself a reservoir which might cover me for one dry winter, or I could in, uh, enter into a long-term agreement with the water company uh, that they will provide me something that looks like resilience services, maybe that when my license and, and my reservoir runs out in the tough, they'll come the, like the cavalry over the hill and supply with some water, and I'll give them a sort of regular payment. And then you get into sort of questions, well, how will that contract work? What's the sort of basis of the contract? How, can, how much can I rely on it to actually deliver? And you get into a much bigger sort of story. So that gets one sort of story where you can get 
from regulation as being a negative, changing, constraining, etc., to actually facilitating some solutions. Another part of the story I think is quite useful, um, which is also about relationships, institutions, and so forth, which is so often missed out of economic stories, um, is that, of course, scarcity is not something absolute. So you then have to say, well, what are the institutions, what are the arrangements to negotiate what these standards might be and move them forward? And, uh, and how do you get the people involved in taking water in that discussion about what the right level of environmental protection should be? And then the market, as such, then becomes a subset of another institution. And, of course, a market is an institution itself, and all markets are different. They hold varieties of institutions. Uh, and this gets you into a very interesting area, of course, is what are appropriate institutions for different circumstances, uh, and how do institutions work, how does power work, who's involved, who has the say, and so forth. So these are all the areas that I'm interested in, uh, because that's what practical policy making is about. Uh, and that's what uh, managing transitions is about, uh, taking people with you, um, trying to get to a place where suddenly people see potential, uh, and they see that uh, their future is in that picture, that they can be part of it. And of course, then you can begin to get things on the ground. Implementation becomes the opportunity because you actually begin to demonstrate in some places what that possible future could look like and how it could work. And once that happens, it can spread. So our system is really a framework to facilitate and empower a set of institutions that can be then tailored and used by people on the ground to create arrangements that actually will work for them, and which then other people can learn from and develop variations of that, which will work in different catchments with different people in different ways. And that will then grow and develop and evolve over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, so it's really moving from one set of institutional constraints to a whole new one, which creates possibilities. How those possibilities turn out is totally a matter for the people on the ground who actually want solutions and a way forward, uh, and the people who, uh, and governments who want to protect the environment. Well, thanks a lot. That's really interesting. It seems to uh, resemble well what we learned a minute ago about a critical theory of uh, social change and the process orientation and the move from an implementation gap towards exploring opportunities between actors on the ground and their individual perceptions of what should happen. Um, before we start discussing this, I would like to move on to the last panelist here, sitting here, and also having been with us, thank you indeed also for this, uh, over the last uh, two days, uh, which is Professor Ian Barker, the Managing Director for uh, Water Policy International Limited, and a long-standing collaborator with organizations like OECD and a huge range of international experience. I understand you got a small presentation. I, I've worked in water all of my life, uh, and until a couple of years ago, I was with the UK Environment Agency, where I had overall responsibility for water management, regulation, and planning across England and Wales. So my background is very much a practitioner as a water manager. Uh, and I came at you know, the, the challenge which had been set um, by, by reading the exam question here in the uh, preparatory note in the conference proceedings, which is, um, at the end of the day, it comes down to decision-making of actors in industry, policy-making, and civil society. So I reflected on the fact that over the course of the day and a half, we've learned a huge amount and seen some fantastic research, <laughs> lots of global maps with lots of red on, and I think we understand the problem, um, but we haven't heard much about a solution uh, and how we can move forward. Uh, but of course, you know, we're not going to come up with a, an answer um, just in a few minutes here because better brains than ours have, have tried, but maybe we can think about a way forward. And for me, it's really important to learn from what other people have done and from their mistakes. So I thought I'll portray a case study. And the case study is of a major city which has gone from um, access to water supply and sanitation of less than 10%, restricted only to the most affluent part of the population. Uh, and for poor people, um, they had nothing and how they've gone from that to universal sanitation, universal secure supplies of water. 
And that journey, what did that look like? And critically, what were the triggers that then allowed the decisions to be made? Uh, and that city is London. Um, and you might be thinking, well, you know, I, last time I turned a tap on in London, water came out, and it, it did. But if you were here 150 or 200 years ago, it wouldn't. There wouldn't have been any taps, not least. So if we could get in Doctor Who's TARDIS and go back a couple of centuries, what would London look like then? Um, the illustration on the left is uh, from a series of engravings by Hogarth, Gin Lane, and you might say some parts of London haven't changed very much since then. <laughs> Uh, but it gives you a feel for what, what life was like in the poorer parts of London at the time. And I mentioned the affluent parts of society did have access to piped water. Not very reliable and not very clean, but they had it. And they had some basic sanitation and there were sewers. But for most people, if you were poor, this is what you're restricted to. A, a pump at some point near you, perhaps almost certainly contaminated water, and reliant upon water sellers who would go down to the River Thames, where all the effluent went, uh, and then they'd sell you that water very expensively compared with your earnings. So that's how things were. And in you know, the capital city of what was then a great country, uh, clearly not a tenable position. And it got worse and worse, because as the population of London grew to something like three million people, by the middle of the 19th century, all of the effluent went into the River Thames, completely untreated. There were sewers, but they just took whatever wasn't running off in the streets, um, and discharged it all into the Thames. And there were water companies supplying people, but their pumps were very often downstream of the sewage discharges, and then people wondered why they got ill. Um, I mentioned there were water pipes, and this is Tottenham Court Road in 1837, laying cast iron water mains. Uh, and so there was a water supply coming in from Hertfordshire and from some other, other companies as well. Uh, and rich people could tap into this. But for most people, they didn't have the luxury of this, and they didn't have the luxury of sanitation. And by the middle of the 19th century, clever people, informed scientists and engineers, were starting to say, this is not a tenable position in terms of sanitation and in the state of the environment. And it took one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century, Michael Faraday, who's best known for electromagnetism, but also was a brilliant chemist and also a little-known environmental scientist, as we would call it today. And it took Michael Faraday to say, this is impossible that the River Thames stinks. It's a bubbling brown sewer. Uh, you can smell it from pretty much wherever you are in London. And as a good scientist, he built up a body of evidence, which everybody ignored. So he was also <laughs> a very good communicator. And like all good communicators, he thought of a way of projecting the information in a way which would resonate with the lay community, parliamentarians, um, and the general public. So what he did was conduct an experiment by taking a boat down the River Thames, and he took his business card, tore it up, and threw it into the river. This was on a sunny day, and then measured the point at which the fragments of his business card disappeared from view. And typically it was within two to three inches before it disappeared between, below this brown soup. And he then, bless you, and then he used that example to write to Parliament, um, uh, setting out the state of the river, the reason why it's in that state, and the consequences of inaction. And the consequences of inaction were that if we had a hot summer, in his judgment, London would become impossible to live in because of the smell from the river. Um, and Parliament ignored his letter. He also wrote to the, Thames, uh, to the Times, which was much more influential because it created a groundswell of opinion amongst opinion informers, the general public. Um, and here is an illustration from Punch, a satirical magazine which was influential in Victorian times, <coughs> with Faraday giving his business card to Father Thames, saying, your time is up, mate. Three years after this, this was 1855, in 1858 there was a thing called the Great Stink. A hot summer, temperatures 35 degrees and higher, and the River Thames got progressively smellier. There were questions asked in Parliament, and the government said, the River Thames has nothing to do with us, um, not our problem. Believe it or not, those questions were asked repeatedly until eventually it became a problem very clearly because there was so much support for something to happen. And eventually, after Parliament had to decamp because the smell from the River Thames was so bad, and the miasma, the smell, the putrid smell from all the open sewers in the streets and from the Thames was so bad, 
coupled with the fact that there were cholera outbreaks, which people were just beginning to understand might be a result of contaminated water, um, as opposed to the sort of smelly fog, um, something had to be done. And the thing that was done was Sir Joseph Bazalgette designing his sewerage system, north and south bank, to take, intercept all the existing sewers um, and to build new, other, new sewers as well, to take all the sewage down to the London estuary and discharge it there, which at least got the problem away from London, but it didn't half make a mess of the estuary. And a few years later, um, a pleasure boat collided with a coal ship and 650 people lost their lives, um, many of them not from drowning, but because they couldn't survive in what was essentially neat sewage. And then people realised, maybe we need to be treating discharge that we make into the Thames estuary. Um, and that's happened, um, thankfully, over the last 150 years and got better and better. So we've got a story here of a chronic problem ignored by the government, which then didn't do something until there was not just scientific evidence, but a public desire to see change and to see investment. And we're now seeing um, that expressed once again because although Bazalgette was a fantastic engineer and far-sighted and he built his sewer <coughs> network to assume a population increase of over 50%, up to 4.5 million. We'd reached that by about 1910. London's now at 8 million. So unsurprisingly, the London sewerage network wasn't able to cope with that population increase and also increase storminess because it's a combined sewer network to take rainfall as well. And we're seeing discharges of untreated sewage coming into the River Thames. So we're now seeing the development of the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is a 21st century version of what Bazalgette did, another big civil engineering project, intercepting all the sewage overflows, taking them down to the estuary for treatment. Um, Again, so a very similar solution in the 21st century to the one they did in the middle of the 19th century. But nonetheless, it will help to solve the problem that we faced in the Thames and in London. So just to, to summarize all of that, um, I'm thinking about a case study to actually deliver an SDG goal number six in particular around water supply and sanitation. What did it take to make it happen? It needed the right people presenting the right evidence in the right way. And we've seen a huge amount of evidence about the problem. Um, but as we know, not enough is happening fast enough to deliver on those SDG goals. So are we presenting, as uh, scientists, engineers, practitioners, that evidence in the right way to make a compelling case? It took political interest and a political will to recognize it as a problem that needs solving. And that had to be reinforced by public opinion and support, because otherwise, sorry, Henry, would the government have done anything? Probably not. It needed that compelling case for change that recognised the consequences of inaction, which is London would become impossible to live in, and it required sustained financial investment over decades on the basis that once you start um, major construction works, you then have to continue with them. But with the benefit of hindsight, um, what it's done is to lock us in the 21st century into an inflexible 19th century solution that struggles to cope with 21st century challenges of population growth and climate change, um, increased environmental standards. And it also created a mindset in the UK water sector that the answer is infrastructure, whatever the question is. Um, and we've had to live with ongoing capital maintenance, which has been expensive and complicated. And it took a long time for the governance, institutional and regulatory arrangements to catch up to the point where they are today so that we've got all the checks and balances in place, we've got fundraising mechanisms to support maintenance and ongoing capital investment. You know, hindsight is great, but can't we take these experiences and this knowledge, transfer them, and then apply them in a much faster way than the century or so that it's taken us in London? We've got an evidence base, but I would put it to you that it's not a case for change. Um, it's just, oh God, it's all gloomy and doom. Um, and we need to shift our emphasis from talking about the problem to talking about the solution. And that solution has to be flexible and adaptive and affordable for the circumstances in which you want to apply that solution. Whatever it looks like, I'm picking up Xavier's point, there is no such thing as an optimal solution. There are always trade-offs. And you need to understand the trade-offs and the risks and uncertainties in whatever 
you finally decide to do. And all that needs to be part of a strategy with, I think, much greater collaboration between academia, practitioners, uh, and policymakers. Um, and there are div divides and divisions between those three groups of people, and we need to bridge those. Thank you. Thanks indeed. Well, thanks for zooming back in time. There was a certain moment when I was a bit scared, uh, waiting for the conclusion, and Ms. Buzzer gently now can do it all over the world. <laughs> and indeed, that was not your conclusion. No. And I liked you coming up with this reflective moment on how solutions eventually uh, could look like today that are more flexible and more adaptive. And you also made the point of the necessary collaborations and including the users, however you may be able to do it. Uh, so that's an important point. And uh, now trying to wrap up a bit, I think this is also something that has been stressed through a number of the presentations that in particular we experienced in the morning, not only coming from Lila stressing also the point of the power relations, but also through the number uh, of the researchers making the uh, different arrangements that go on in places like Indonesia or in other places and bring it a bit more to the forefront. The question probably to you as I would say practitioners would be are there uh, secrets to a successful collaboration? Uh, Henry you've been out in the field in a way, you talked to a lot of people. The question was raised uh, how do you uh, start reaching out to smallholder farmers type, less organized interest. So the secrets to a successful collaboration, that's eventually something that I would like to ask you to reflect upon in a sort of final statement here. Uh, are there secrets to a successful collaboration in the sense of that you could pick some winners first and ask them to join your proposal but then if you pick the winners, you also have the question of how you deal with potential losers. So the uh, uh, type of collaboration, that's certainly something where well, governance research is struggling with. But what would be your practical experience from years of dealing with the issue? Well, they are the practitioners. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, well, the, it's, it's a very valid question. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, the, the, the critical part is that we have to understand that these are very long processes. I mean, it took tw more than 20 years for the UK to come up with that kind of solution. I mean, to, which, which may not even be the solution, but uh, as you Five. said... Well, but the... the, 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 the was first in 1997. Yeah, yes. but it didn't get over. very far. No, no but the, the discussion about the reform of the water allocation regime dates back... A, yeah. a, a long time, and I mean, yesterday we heard about the Murray Darling Basin. I think it it took more than twenty years to uh, put it in place. Uh, more than that? <laughs> well, okay, well, well, it's it's it, it's really an interesting point. It, it all depends how you used. I mean, what kind of narrative you you want to support? But the and and the system is not fixed yet. It's still fluid. So there are still some adjustment, etc. So um, I'm I'm not quite sure there is. A, a, I don't think we can find an appropriate sequence, but it's critical to understand that these are very long-lasting processes, and as much as you can, you have to be equipped already to uh, such uh, long journeys, uh, that's, uh, which, which is usually difficult for a government, because you look for quicker fixes. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you tend to look for, for quick fixes, whereas we know these reforms take a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think actually that um, I think in policy failure is really important, um, and admitting to failure uh, because that uh, produces the potential for uh, a better effort, if you like. Because I mean, part of the I think the fact that um, I like to think we're succeeding more than <laughs> previous efforts is um, that there was a sort of recognition that um, I mean actually. The, the, time, the, the previous attempt at reform, the immediate preceding attempt at reform, was just so exceptionally cat-handed that, um, <laughs> but, but not because, because someone at the last minute, I think it was a, a, a director in DEFRA rang up his counterpoint in the environment day and said, oh, we're just, we're just finishing off our water strategy, 
yeah, we haven't got anything in, in about abstraction, so is there anything you want? And the answer came back, well, let's roll out time-limited license, uh, licenses across the piece. And so there was a sentence, basically, in the 2009 statement to this, uh, putting the solution before even working out what the problem was. And so it broke every single possible rule. And then there was a consultation, which was a total disaster. Um, and so that experience then, then allowed the possibility of saying, actually, well, if we're going to do this, We've got to try and do it properly, and we've got to be systematically, we've got to think through it, we've got to have the evidence base, we've got to have the processes, we've got to invest in it. Uh, and so, we, for instance, we invested uh, one and a half million in uh, the modelling to, to develop the evidence base, and actually trying to work out uh, the benefits of things in a, in a context of uncertainty uh, and risk, because water is it's about risk and uncertainty, uncertainty, I think, really. Um, is, is quite, you know, it's a very complex uh, modelling task. Um, so being able to produce some numbers that uh, Treasury could uh, uh, sort of had to agree were, you know, at least uh, 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 sort of had some basis to them. So, so we, it was, the, I think it was the first time that there was a substantial enough investment of time and energy in the process to get to a reasonable place. Uh, even, obviously, there had been previous attempts, but I suppose, as you say, governments, why would they invest like that unless they've already experienced not adequate investment and failing uh, uh, to actually make the, make the effort and put the time in? Um, the other reflection is that you've then, you've got to find um, problems, real problems that you can potentially solve um, and find the people with those problems. Problems are opportunities. Um, so. I've been going around the country and talking to people who are in the worst possible situation with regards to water uh, and think I'm going to come along and make the situation worse. So the conversations start, uh, quite often I'm sitting behind a table, they're all in front, they may have something in their pocket that's not very nice to throw at me at any moment, and they start by saying how I'm going to destroy their businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and by the end of the conversation, if it goes well, and it has recently, they begin to say, well, actually, maybe I could save their businesses. Um, and going from that, from the fact that they, they see you as against them and, and their enemy, to potentially seeing you as actually part of their solution um, is the process uh, that, that you've got to get to in terms of bringing people on board. Yeah, thank you. Well, it reminds me that there is also sometimes an element of mistrust. Uh, maybe towards DEFRA, maybe towards other ministries or politics in general, but that's certainly something where this process of deliberating also is something where the policymakers can win in the sense of that they can regain trust and make people aware of that there are actually opportunities that can be shared. Thank you. Ian? Yes, I think what, what, what Henry's described is, is, is quite rare, which is for a policymaker to actively engage, and that's, that's a brave thing to do because, as Henry's described so often, the reaction is um, fear, antagonism, being defensive. Um, and it takes a while to develop trust so it then becomes a productive conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and for me, you know, to move anything forward, that's absolutely critical, that you're having the right conversations with the right people, and that you're doing it in a spirit of openness and honesty. Um, explaining what you know um, and why you think you know it, but also, very importantly, what you don't know. Uh, and I think in terms of some of the problems we've been talking about the last couple of days, um, we know a lot, but there's a lot that we don't know. Um, and I think some of the things we don't know are how do we move all of this forward in a way which will then deliver some actions. And, and I think you know, for, for collaboration to work, it, it means that um, you know, maybe we need to have the conversations that we haven't had so far, or haven't had quite in the right way, um, uh, you know, across different sectors and between um, different groups, policymakers, academics, um, practitioners. Uh, and in one of my old jobs, I would engage with various universities. Um, and you know, my plea to them was, can you help me make my life easier? Uh, and you know, as, as a regulator and a water manager, that's, that's all I wanted, um, was to have an easy life. Um, it, you know, it never happened, um, but what it did do was to spawn some, um, some research we'd ha which had um, uh, 
a bias towards um, action and improving the quality and speed of decision making. Um, and you know, when you're faced with problems, it's, the critical thing is to remember that at some point, some poor soul is going to have to make a decision. And whoever that is, is can only do it with the best information they've got to hand. Um, and the, the better that information, the better decision, uh, and the more likelihood it will be sustainable and affordable yeah. and, and so on. So it, it needs that dialogue to, to help with that decision-making process. Yeah. Two, two, quick, two quick points uh, in addition to, uh, first to challenge Henry a little bit. The, the, when you pass the, that piece of le legislation, it will be an important milestone, but it's not the end of the process, as, as you know. Uh, so how, how much time it will take for these arrangements to really uh, uh, disseminate uh, and, and deliver, it's still an open question. So uh, that's why we, and, and it's, part, it's part of the reform process, uh, as, as, uh, as you know. Uh, um, another point I, I wanted to emphasize, when you talk about these processes, uh, sequences probably matter, but also the question is who you engage with. And uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that we are all water people talking to water people, and most of the time the solution is not in the water community. Um, we have to engage with property developers, we have to engage with farmers, we have to engage with uh, uh, pri private investors because they are, they are part, of the, part of the answer. Uh, so there is always a risk of the water community being you know, self-referential, um, whereas the, the, it's probably not the most powerful one and it's um, usually very effective to liaise with people who can make things happen, which may be outside of the water community. So. Can I just come back on... Um you know, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, um, but what has happened, what is beginning to happen, uh, is that we're creating stories of how that future might look. Um, and those stories to start with are, are maybe fairly schematic and not all filled in, but a, a group of people then um, sort of gather around that story uh, um, and begin to try and fill it in. So that even though we haven't actually put the, we haven't got the legislation, we actually haven't implemented, we haven't got the systems, we've already got people creating the stories and filling in the detail and becoming demanders for the end result. And that's really important because the likes of the Environment Agency wanting an easy life and not having a lot of resources and us giving them a really difficult time is that it's very easy for these things, well, they're not quite important, uh, you know, do they have to, we pass some legislation, how it's implemented by the environment agencies is another thing altogether. But if there is a beginning on the ground, a set of people who begin to get promises, political promises, that their problems are going to be solved, suddenly they have an angle to actually force implementation because they know that actually, they, unless that legislation is properly implemented on the ground, they've got some real problems. And they have political leverage, they have relationships with ministers, and they can use them. And so you create a system where you actually have people out there who are dragging this reform through and are making sure that it happens. Uh, and it's only that way uh, that I, once that's in place, I can feel that I can go and do something else. Uh, because I know that the dynamics are in place that will allow reform to happen. Um, because there are actually real people on the ground who are then, uh, you know, wanting it to actually happen. And then I think it's a fair chance it will happen. Thank you. Um, I got a note from Ian just that uh, he would need to leave uh, in time, 1.30, and uh, I suggest we really try to finish now in time, because some of you also might have to leave, and therefore I would like to make an attempt now to, um, uh, to wrap up here. And uh, first, indeed, I wish to thank all of you here on the panel, but indeed all of you here on the floor, uh, in giving all these valuable contributions uh, to our overarching topic of uh, water and the SDGs. I think we learned quite a lot over the last one and a half days about the issue which doesn't seem to be the scarcity per se, but rather the allocation of the complexity of the water supply chain and the water available. And then we learned a lot about the different market mechanisms and the models out there. And I guess while we all appreciate the, what you call the plurality of the existing models in total, where you have a variety of different approaches, be it more macroeconomically oriented or more micro-simulation of 
um, of, of strategies on the ground, there is also the feeling that there is a range of uncertainties. Since we don't know exactly what uh, sort of water is needed either for meeting the needs of the people or for the environment to maintain the basic uh, environmental functions of supporting the uh, ecosystems. So this range of uncertainties actually uh, leads us back to research indeed, but at the same time also we realize as researchers that there is a demand from policy making including the OECD um, to have dialogues and uh, probably there is also a role for research for universities, for academics, but also for people while well, doing research as, as uh, as uh, analysts in engaging in these processes. And what I learned from you during the panel here is that there is a need for better evidence, uh, partly better data, but also well, simulation, modeling results that could help to deliver at least a tentative suggestion on what might be the opportunities for certain actors in uh, entering new agreements. So the uh, wording that came up here of implementation as an opportunity. I think that's really also interesting for researchers in trying to work on benefit sharing agreements in giving better estimates what a, you call it, easier life, you call it better life, mm -hmm. uh, however you call it, so how a life with a sufficient access to water could look like. And uh, this indeed then uh, leads us back into the issues of uh, who would be the main actors of the water <coughs> value chain. You, uh, Xavier, a minute ago mentioned the risk of the water community being self-referential. Well, that might be a risk, but actually if you include what Tony and others have said about the uh, number of actors that need to be evolved, and if you realize that indeed oh, are we at the hierarchy of the typical water users where the irrigation farmers are typically at the lower end while more emphasis in existing contracts is giving to energy users, to industrial users, to the urban population for the political risk addressed throughout the symposium, then you can hardly think of anybody who would not need to be part of any such water community. So in that regard I think the risk of being self-referential is just existent if the borders of who are water users and providers are rather narrowly defined. But the more you accept, and this has been a topic throughout the symposium here, that it is, well, we are all needing water, but a number of different interests grappling with the temporary shortages of water that they all need to come together to the table and engage in a process towards a delivery of the sustainable development goal. So that's probably something that at least I learned throughout the symposium and I would probably not think that the risk of being too self-referential uh, uh, then is that high. Uh, so there is a need for more research, there's a need for more process-oriented research and actor-specific research here that would then eventually be able to deliver benefits and opportunities. So. Uh, uh, thanks to all of you. I look forward to see some of you then outside during our lunch reception and do a last uh, round of talks. And I wish to give our panelists a hand. <laughs>